Hi, everybody. I am here with Lindy Boats. She is currently in Singapore. She was born in South Africa and she is an amazing polyglot. And I just feel so honored that you're here to do this live interview with me because I know that you have a lot going on. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I am uh, glad we're doing this at 9 p.m. my time because I'm definitely a night owl. Yes. So I think our time zones actually worked out really perfectly and I'm really glad to be here, thanks. Yeah, yeah, because there's exactly a 12 hour time difference because I am in South Carolina and you're in Singapore. So morning time here, evening time there. And we're just here to talk about languages, which is so fun. So thank I thank you guys. It. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your upbringing. I would love to hear a little bit. So I was born in Pretoria, South Africa, and we moved a bit between Pretoria and Cape Town for a few years before my dad's job sent us to Paris. And I was really, really young. So I think my mom told me the only thing I would say was like stand at the door and be like, bonjour, madame, when my mom's French teacher came in on weekdays. So I could only bonjour, madame, for, for <laughs> the most of my uh, early years. And uh, then I think we were only in France for like nine months. And then we moved directly to Pakistan, which was a big cultural shock coming from Paris to Pakistan. Wow. But Pakistan is one of my favorite countries. It is so beautiful. The nature is stunning. The people are are very hospitable. Um, but it was it was difficult, um, you know, being unprepared. I mean, usually mm -hmm. we uh, we will know which country they'll send us to, and we can kind of learn a bit about the language or the culture beforehand. But this was very sudden. Yeah. But we stayed there for about. Um, three and a half, almost four years. And that's where I was really exposed to people from different countries because I went to an international school and I took French at school in Pakistan, mm -hmm. as well as a little bit of Urdu. Mm -hmm. And then after that, um, we moved back to South Africa and then to Dubai for five years, which is where I continued with French at school and I learned Arabic as a school subject. Wow. But I didn't take it that seriously. I was just like, this was a school subject. I uh, wish I put in more effort and kept my Arabic up. Yeah. I had a lot of Korean friends at school in Dubai. And when I moved back to South Africa, I decided to start learning Korean, which was my first self-study Korean language, uh, Korean <laughs> language, foreign language. <laughs> and how old were you then? Uh, I was probably in grade nine. So what is that like? 15 maybe. Yeah. 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 Wow. Oh, 10 years ago, 25. Yeah, around 15. What did your dad do that had you moving around so much? He's a diplomat, so he works for um for foreign affairs, so he works at the South African embassy in a few different okay. countries. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. How do you feel like moving around so much at such a young age shaped who you are today? Um it definitely broadened my horizons. I got to meet people from all over and be sort of at home in different cultures. Mm -hmm. I can't say that I 100% feel like fully, fully, fully Afrikaans because I was so disconnected from Afrikaans culture and even language for many years yeah. that when I do speak Afrikaans, um, people say, oh, you sound like a foreigner speaking Afrikaans or the words you use are so archaic. Yeah. I said one word to my brother a few weeks ago and he could not stop laughing. He's like, you sound like a news reporter. Like the word you're using is so archaic. I'm like, what? Because oh, I never yeah. learned Afrikaans at school. I just learned from my parents or like maybe the news. Yeah. Um, yeah. So do so, your parents speak Afrikaans to you then? Yeah, we speak Afrikaans at home. Okay. okay. Yeah. So... I guess to get back to your question, I, I don't feel 100% Afrikaans because of circumstances, but I also mm -hmm. don't feel like, you know, I'll ever um, assimilate 100% into another culture as well. So kind of just floating around, which is cool because languages and multilingual people, polyglots online, we all kind of feel at home in our online language space. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Hi, you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Write in the comment box, where are you guys watching from? We would love to know. And so that is so interesting for sure. What language do you feel most at home with? Like, this is, Oh, this is that me. is 
so difficult to answer because I think it also depends like what do you feel like what do you define as at home because of course Afrikaans feels like like house home like this is where my parents are and my family is but because I've learned Korean for the longest I everyone knows that super embarrassing video I have coming out of surgery speaking Korean that was completely a subconscious thing maybe Korean is so like comfortable or oh, ingrained okay. in me that you know in a I don't know, dopey, waking up from anesthesia state, it just came out, you know, yeah. you can't control that. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a language that you started to learn and then you're like, no, I'm not learning this language. Oh, so <laughs> many, so many. Okay. A lot of them. You can probably name a few and I'll be like, yep, try that, try that, try that. Um, no, I, no issues with any of the languages. There's nothing yeah. like personally I have against them. It's just circumstances. So Greek, for okay. instance. Okay. Nobody knows that during high school, I actually tried to learn Greek. I had like a Greek poetry book, but it's just circumstantial. Like I didn't have any Greek friends. I wanted to focus on other languages. So there's quite a few. Okay. Uh, I think all languages are, are valuable, beautiful, but mm -hmm. uh, circumstantially, I, I never really needed to use it at that point in my life. Yeah. What language, because you speak so many, has been the most frustrating for you up until now? Um, I would say it's probably the ones that I really enjoy, but don't find myself putting enough effort into. For example, okay. Vietnamese, mm -hmm. it's very challenging because it's tonal. I find it so beautiful. I always listen to Vietnamese music. A lot of my colleagues are Vietnamese, but yeah. I know that I could do better if I just put in effort. So yeah. that's my own fault, but it is challenging. Yeah. So you do, you were telling me about you, that you have two full-time jobs. And so your YouTube channel is like your side thing. And then you do everything for it, all of your editing and everything, which could be a full-time job in and of itself. Could you tell me a little bit about your two jobs that you do? Yeah. So I um, work at a local Singaporean startup. So I work in the tech space. I'm a UI UX designer and I'm doing Android, iOS, and web designs there and helping manage the design team. Mm -hmm. And on the side, I guess, is a lot of more side projects. So um, I don't necessarily have to like registered uh, employment jobs, but I do a lot of just projects that I enjoy. So helping yeah. out friends, um, building some language apps, or I guess m maintaining my own website would almost be a full-time job as well as having to update YouTube weekly. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Lots, of, lots of language stuff on top of design. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What inspired you to start your YouTube channel? Because it's been a while now. Yeah. Way back in the day, I would say probably the first generation of YouTube polygots came out around maybe between 2010 to 2012. So that was wow. Timothy Doner, Richard Simcott, Professor Aguelas. And I, I watched their videos. Maybe Luca Lampariello was there as well. And I was like, oh, man, these people are so inspiring and so cool. And I could barely speak any languages. And, you know, I just had English, Afrikaans, French, and Korean under my belt. I That's just it. started just those. <laughs> <laughs> I started learning Japanese, Chinese, and dabbling in Vietnamese. So I thought if people like Timothy Donor can make a video where they speak a lot of languages, I want to try it more for documentation purposes. Like I want to track my progress and join the very small online community that there was on YouTube back then. Yeah. Uh, so my channel had like barely any growth for like three or four years, but I just kept going because I enjoyed the like five or 10 people who I got <laughs> to interact with. Uh, That's amazing. Yeah. Can I just stop you for a minute? That is absolutely amazing that you just <laughs> kept going and kept going because it can be discouraging. I think many people start YouTube channels and quit because YouTube is like an ocean and you're like the little fish in there trying to find your way. That's true. But again, I started in around 2011, 2012, and YouTube was not a career back then, except for like the yeah. really famous original YouTube um, stars like uh, Ryan Higa, you know, those really famous comedians who made YouTube their career. If you were like a language YouTuber, you, that couldn't be a career. So I think it... I didn't take it that seriously back then. That's why I didn't um, feel discouraged. I was like, this is just mm -hmm. something I can use for myself. And yeah, was, I think once you start growing subscribers, then you start looking at numbers and that's when you might feel discouraged. But if you don't take it seriously, then it's yeah. fine. 
Yeah, that's so good. Do you feel like you take it seriously now? Yes, now I do, because I do recognize that I have a platform to be able to share advice and help and stuff. And I got a really encouraging comment today from someone saying they really appreciate how I'm using my platform to share about things in a um, you know, calm manner, not not attacking other people or creating drama. And I, I was like, yeah. yeah, you know, comments like these make it worth it. Um, yeah. So that's what I mean when I say I take it seriously. I don't mm -hmm. want to um, be part of any YouTube drama. And it's not like I look yes. at it as like a career so that I have to monetize. If, if that was my viewpoint, I would use clickbait titles, you know, like mm -hmm. Polygon speaks 5,000 languages in 20 <laughs> minutes. You know, yeah. those videos get a lot of views. Yeah. But I don't take it seriously in that sense. I take mm -hmm. it seriously in the sense of recognizing that I'm able to communicate and reach people. So yeah. how might I help or inspire them? Yeah. And something that I personally have noticed about your channel and your videos is your authenticity. You say it how it is. You're vulnerable with your language learning journeys. Like you just put out your video and it was actually very impressive. Eight months of Hungarian, a full video. And then the coolest thing is, I just have to tell people, is that somebody, your favorite band saw from Hungary, they invited you to one of their concerts, you got on the Hungarian news. Like, how do you feel just when these open doors happen from you just putting yourself out there? How does that make you feel? Of course, I'm incredibly grateful, you know. Um people are are being really friendly and open to me and very welcoming when I do learn their language. It's not just me from my side um, opening all the doors. You know, it, it goes both ways. People are being very hospitable. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it does take uh, a little bit of guts or confidence. And I yeah. really didn't have confidence uh, many years ago or even when I started my channel. Um, if, if somebody asked me, back then to be on like an interview, I would say, Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, you know, I'm way too shy, go find someone else. Yeah. But now it's it's not that I like want to be famous or want to be on interviews. It's like, yeah, you know, this is an opportunity to share. It's an opportunity to meet a new person and to just chat about what I'm passionate about. Yes. So yes. I'm really grateful. It's fun. Yeah, I love that. I think that's been my favorite thing as well i just started my online like my channel and everything less than a year ago but by far the most fun thing is doing interviews like this and getting to meet people like you i'm like oh for my sure. gosh this is amazing i'm so yeah. grateful for for i'm gonna sound like a boomer so grateful for the internet and how we can <laughs> talk to each other but i mean that in the sense that yeah. um i think a lot of women specifically people who i have spoken to and myself included many years ago we do struggle with feelings of envy and comparison and sometimes when we look at other people who might have a youtube channel or an instagram account that's doing really well we might think um i don't know negative thoughts towards them but i found that just reaching out to someone and talking to them even just in the space like this uh on a live interview you actually get to know them as people and you don't just see them as like some content creator who's performing really well that you can be jealous of you know mm. it, it, being able to connect with people like this and understanding them more as friends you get to a point where you really honestly start to support them from your heart it's no longer like mm. you versus them it's like there's space for all of us here mm -hmm. we're all mm -hmm doing something with a mutual goal yeah. and sharing it's it's not that it's me versus you it's me and you sharing in the space together yeah. so that's why i'm really grateful for being able to collaborate with people it helps both of us grow i love that that's so good how do you personally just overcome comparison even back maybe back in the day you know comparing yourself as far as language learning goes or as far as just your presence online, how do mm -hmm. you, I guess, overcome comparison? Because I think everyone at some point will have some of that, you know, in them. Yeah, I can think of uh, two or three things. Um, so I'll start from the basic one is um, really my parents helped me a lot when I was still a very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sometimes English doesn't come to me impressionable is that the yeah, right word that's a great word impressionable mm -hmm. high school student i would often go to my parents when i was feeling like down or needed advice and they just kind of helped ground me like say yeah. you know it's um what someone else is saying about you is th their opinion and everybody has an opinion and 
that's not who you are, right? Mm -hmm. and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that, just helping me through like hate comments or, or comparison. I didn't really have much comparison with language learning speed itself. Mm -hmm. Right mm -hmm. now, it's more just like, you know, trolls or hate comments or yeah. Reddit threads. Reddit threads are so disgusting and oh, horrible. No. Yeah, I, I shouldn't even have said that in case people go, look, it is so toxic. But wow. that's my second point is I try to stay away from that. I mm. know, I know, I know there are threads about me, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. just by not reading them, yeah. I already feel better, you know, mm -hmm. just by ignoring it. I know it's mm -hmm. out there, but what help is it going to do me to to read it? Right. Yes. Um, yes. And then what was the other one? Just remembering that, like, it, it, touching on my earlier point, um, that there's space for all of us, mm -hmm. and we're all just mm -hmm. sharing a passion. That doesn't mean we have to compete. Yeah, that's so good. I love that. How, okay, do you feel, you mentioned maybe not, but how do you deal with, like, okay, I'm going to learn this new language. Do you put yourself out there and let people know right away and just let them in on the journey from <laughs> the get-go or... <laughs> What That's is your such... process? Because once you put it out there, I did it with French. I'm like, yeah. you guys, I'm documenting my French journey uh -huh. just on Instagram. And then I'm like, oh, crap, three months in. I've got to keep documenting this journey. That's so funny and so true. Um, I've thought, like, how cool would it be if I just keep a language secret for a long time and then, like, in three years be like, hello, everybody. Look at me. I speak this language and I didn't tell anybody. That would be super fun. But yeah. I'm too excited. I just I love sharing. I'm way too passionate. So I know. Uh, to a fault. So if I start a new, like Burmese, I was so excited about it, but I really haven't touched it. And I know there are some sweet, sweet Burmese people in the comments who are like, I'm so glad you're learning my language. I'm like, oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> I still love your language. I just haven't made time for it. Yeah. Um, so to answer your question, yes, I, I might even overshare. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because it is exciting. It is so exciting. And yeah. it's fun because you meet new people, you know, that you didn't even know were out there for that sure. find you because of the language you're learning and then yeah. you can connect with them and it's yeah. super fun. Yeah. Okay. So I know that like as a language learner myself, I know I cannot compare myself to somebody else's journey, but sometimes in my own mind, I'm like, okay, Camille, like with French, I'm like, I'm giving... I'm giving myself two years with French. Do you do that yourself? Do you be like, I'm giving myself this amount of time to get to a good level? Do you have goals mm -hmm. like that? Or what is your process going on? No, I, I never really give myself like a time to finish learning or become fluent because it's yeah. a lifelong journey. Like I'm still not yeah. fluent in my own language. I'm still learning new words every right, day. Right, right. So I never look at it as like a okay. cutoff time because I know I'm always going to be learning. Yeah. Um, but I guess if I have like actionable goals, like a language exam or mm -hmm. uh, wanting to travel for a trip or wanting to finish a textbook, I might have small goals like that, but never, okay. I don't really think of it in months or years. Okay. But when do you decide, okay, I'm wanting to start this other language now and focus on it because you still have then all these other languages yeah. that you have to either continue to learn, to maintain... It's like the struggle, right? Because the desire, I, I feel desire already to start a new language. And I'm not at a point where I feel like I can yet, you know? Mm, I think I'm still trying to learn what the best way is to manage this. So I get very, yeah. I'm very emotional, not in the sense of like overreacting or crying, but emotional and like I get very passionate about things. And I'm like a little magpie always searching for the new shiny thing. So... Um, uh, if I just hear a new language and I really like the way it sounds, I'm probably going to start dabbling in it. Um, yeah. So I don't try and block myself from that. I don't uh, stop myself and say, no, that's enough for today. I just allow myself to explore. And I know that with time, if it's meant to be, I'll continue learning. If not, then it was like a fun little side adventure. And mm -hmm. then I continue back on my main road of the other languages I like to keep working on. That's cool. So you decide based on just your own interest in Pretty the much. language. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's um, cool. Which is important for me because it helps me keep motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, I have lovely people in my comments who always suggest, please learn this language. Please <laughs> learn that sure. language. But I, I don't see why. Like, but yeah, maybe if you learn Afrikaans, I'll learn your language. You know, hello. <laughs> it's yeah, not just, there like, you go. I'm not an there entertainer. I'm not here to um, perform. Yeah. You know? So yeah. I 
I appreciate it. I, I love that people are so passionate about their languages. I share that passion, Yeah. but it, it's not realistic. You mm -hmm. know, I have to maintain my other ones. I have to, you know, put my job and my family first. Uh, totally. So I appreciate it, but I, I have to learn languages for the reasons that I choose and not because someone is like, you should do it for fun. Yeah. I'm not going to be motivated. Yeah, because there is so much work that goes into language learning. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So much yeah, of your definitely. time is invested. So yeah. it has to come from you wanting to do it yeah for sure somebody's asking if we can speak spanish together i don't want to put you on the spot and have us perform no hay problema un poquito okay entonces podemos hablar un poco en español no sé si vale. las otras personas van a entendernos pero estamos aquí sí no hay problema sí yo aprendí español en guadalajara méxico wow Has sí. vivido, uh, ¿cómo se llama? Uh, I don't know the past tense uh -huh. in Spanish. ¿Has yet? vivido ahí? Uh -huh. ¿Has vivido en México? Sí, sí, durante Por... un año y también viví dos años en España, en Barcelona. ¡Qué bien! Mm. ¡Wow! Sí, sí, sí. <laughs> Hablas con fluidez, muy bien. Thank you. Yeah, it is fun. It's fun. I love, okay, that is one of the funnest things about talking to polyglots is like I do have some friends that speak all the same five languages that I do. And then we can just switch and it's just yeah. more for fun, you know? I love it. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, I have, of course, and if you guys have a question as well, feel free to write it in the question box. If you're new here, I'm hanging out with Lindy. Just I like to say picking her brain. I love this opportunity to just ask her questions, to be here with her, to learn more about her, to learn how she even learns. So feel free if you guys have a burning question to write it mm -hmm. in the question box. And we're so glad that you're here with us today. So, okay. I would love to ask you how, do you have the same method for starting languages? Do you do the same thing every time you start a new language? Definitely not. I Every language has a different grammar structure. So the way I have to approach learning it is quite different. And mm -hmm. the sort of stage at my life where I'm at or the type of resources I have available also affects it. Yeah. So, um, you know, when I started learning French, that was at school. So it was a completely different environment. Mm -hmm. And when I started mm -hmm. learning Korean, I didn't have many resources. You could not buy a Korean textbook in South Africa. Yeah. Wow. So I had to really make do and put myself in situations where I could meet Korean people. Um, mm -hmm. I applied for a, a part-time job at a Korean restaurant. Um, so I kind of picked it up through wow. a lot of trial and error and speaking. Whereas now with Hungarian, even though it's not that much of a popular language, I can find apps and resources for it, which I couldn't yeah. do with Korean, for instance. Yeah, totally. Yeah. What apps are your favorite apps? Do you have any go-to apps? Yes, uh, also depends on the language. The recent one that I'm using is called Speakly. I yeah. really like the interface. I just watched so your video. Cool. I just watched your video that you did. It was really they're good. They're so cool. I, I know they're going to expand to a few other languages soon, so I'm hoping Hungarian will be on the list. Yeah. Uh, but I really like them because they focus on a lot of um, listening and speaking practice. You, mm -hmm. They really train you to like speak, which is great. Yeah. And um, what, what else did I want to say about it? I just had a brain fart. But yeah, definitely Speakly for, for now. But there's how, a lot of others. That's so good. How do you meet people to practice the languages? Do you have certain apps for that? Or is it just that now because of your online presence, people are like, I can help you. <laughs> I didn't want to say that. But yes, I am very, very <laughs> grateful that there are people who reach out to me. And sometimes I feel so bad because I get so many messages from people saying, oh, yeah. I'm so excited you're learning Hungarian. If you ever you want to practice me with me, you can. And yeah. that's really sweet. And I appreciate it. But I can't reply to 50 people a week asking right. me to practice with them. It's it's wonderful. It's so lovely. I wish I could. I know. But I can't. So I try yes. to stick to also a structured environment. So maybe just having a tutor for mm -hmm. beginner languages or people mm -hmm. around me, uh, you know, language exchange, um, my friends who speak the languages so I can maintain friendships as well. So. Yeah. 
Totally. I know that's the thing that I find that I struggle with with languages because you we're like one person. So we can't invest all of our time, you know, hours and hours every day in every language. Yeah. We have jobs and lives and things. And so it's hard because I wish as well, like I could just invest so many hours in all of the languages and just invest in people like so many languages so many people but it's yeah physically impossible to do that so I feel your struggle for sure I remember telling my parents once like I wish I could just take off an entire year and just learn languages but yeah uh, I I still have to eat you know I can't quit my job and learn languages and yeah I'm quite envious of some some people who do YouTube and languages full time and they run their own like language academies or are able to travel every few months and really live languages. But I guess the rest of us have to make do with the time we have between our other commitments. And of course, you know, it's not easy running your own language business, but it's in a completely language space. Yeah. Uh, So you are exposed to that more. But there's a lot of work that goes into both. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's good. Okay. Somebody is asking how we manage your, our time when we speak three or four languages in order to maintain them, which is a really great question. That is a really good question. Do you, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I can do that. So I have a lot less languages to manage than Lindy does. So currently I'm learning French. And so I invest most of my time with the French language. And so it looks like probably a couple of hours a day where I am either talking to somebody on a phone call, I'm watching YouTube videos, I'm listening to podcasts. A lot of my stuff is more on the go. I'm not sitting there taking a lot of notes or things like that because I have three small kids and I'm busy and so I do a lot of things. And then with maintaining the other languages, it's having, I would say, weekly calls. So I used to have daily calls when I was learning Portuguese. And now it's just maybe two times a week I have a call with somebody. Mm -hmm. Maybe me and my husband will watch a Portuguese movie one night. Um, We have a weekly Bible study in Spanish. So it's just different things like that to maintain the language. But for me, really, I found that phone calls are great because I'm living the language. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think people underestimate how much practice you can get in passively, at least when you're at like an intermediate or advanced level, you don't have to be sitting in front of a textbook learning Mm -hmm. or reviewing flashcards, just exposing yourself to the language through phone calls or talking to friends really helps keep it alive. Yes. So what I've done recently is started tracking the amount of time I spend with languages. Mm -hmm. And I don't do it in a way that's like, um, I don't choose and say I'm going to spend five hours learning Hungarian this week and and whatever. I kind of just see where my time goes and then I work on that. So I have little bar graphs where I track my time. So one week I spent six hours with Hungarian and uh, one hour with Tagalog or let's see. I love the colors. (laughs) Thank you. And then other weeks are not that much. So I spent more time reading here. And then um, Hungarian was just an hour and French was just 22 yeah. minutes a week. And uh, this week, because I was preparing for the TV interview, it was six hours of Hungarian and wow, uh, no wow. other languages, actually. Yeah. So I... That's good. What I'm trying to say with that is I don't necessarily do all my language every week or every month. Mm -hmm. I just kind of look at it retrospectively and say, what did I do? Yeah. And then try and analyze, um, is this the most important language I should be spending my time on now? What other languages do I want to improve? Can I schedule that in? So I don't pressure myself to practice 10 or 12 languages a week. That would be impossible. Yeah, I think that's good. I think that's even something I was thinking because I have a life goal of learning 10 languages and I was like okay like I feel like pretty much at my max right now (laughs) with Mm -hmm. five you know so I was like how do people do it that speak 10 like you yeah well it's also building up you definitely cannot start from from zero with all of them at the same time and yeah I, I think a lot of people don't didn't watch the entire video that I made there's this video where I was talking about my plan for 12 languages a year uh, in a year. Yeah. I think people interpret that as 12 languages starting from zero. Impossible. I would love to meet a person who could do that. Yeah. What I meant is maintaining maybe four or five or six and then uh, 
keep going from intermediate to advanced for another mm -hmm. or um, mm -hmm. starting from beginner, maybe two or three and splitting it out throughout months, not everything in one day or one week. So yeah. it's a lot of language stacking as well. Mm -hmm. And for you, because you're learning romance languages, I'm sure you're learning French at a light speed because it's so similar to uh, Spanish and Italian, right? So you can kind yeah. of build on to those. Yeah, I'm a little afraid for the next language I'm planning on learning Turkish because it's completely, oh. <laughs> completely it's different. Hard. I know. The grammar is complex. Oh. It's beautiful. Yeah. I know. I know. So I'm like, oh my goodness. What oh, you'll thinking? be able to do it. <laughs> I think so. I think yes. so. Okay. How important is mindset when it comes to language learning? Mm. Really, really important. I think even more so. Um, I hate the phrase in today's society, but really in today's yeah. society where we are just bombarded by negativity or comparison or um, fake stuff online. Even we, I, I just made a video about I this. I saw yesterday. it. I loved it. Go watch her video. Her last one <laughs> after you. this live. Yes. <laughs> um, what I mean is we, we have to have a healthy mindset for ourselves. Otherwise we're just going to believe everything that everyone says. We're going to compare ourselves um, if you see somebody who's progressing faster than you, you don't know either how true that is or yeah. how much time and effort they actually put into it. So if you're yeah. not putting in the same effort, if you're spending all your time watching these videos and not actually studying, you can't complain either. Right? Yeah. So mindset yeah. is absolutely important mm -hmm. and um, it takes a lot of time to develop it. So yeah. as I mentioned earlier, I was extremely shy when I was in high school mm -hmm. and I never ever wanted to practice with people. I sort of just kept to myself. And it doesn't mean everybody has to, you know, become confident extroverts and talk to people, yeah. but that was something that was important for me. Uh, but it took me years to learn that, to mm -hmm. change my mindset from a fear-based mindset to a growth-based mindset. Yeah. So it takes a while, but it's important. So what are your best tips for changing your mindset and going from a fear-based to a growth-based mindset? Mm -hmm. I think for one is removing the focus from yourself. Sometimes we are afraid of making mistakes because we think people are going to laugh at us or we're going to yeah. look like a failure. Mm -hmm. um, if you just take it easy and relax a bit and not have such high expectations, mm -hmm. that'll be better as well. Um, mm -hmm. So just comparing yourself to your past self and not comparing yourself to others will help. Yeah. And also just like uh, thinking about what is important for you. For some mm -hmm. people, it might be being able to speak to a lot of people. So you might need to practice um, coming out of your shell or taking on some challenges like speaking in front of a group, stuff like that. If that's not important for you, if you have different goals, that helps too. Otherwise, you're going to start building a mindset that's maybe not in accordance to your goals, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Do you get afraid with new languages to the first time you're starting to say those words, your first oh, words? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I still do. I, you yeah. know, nobody likes to feel like they're struggling and I speaking know. a language as a beginner, you are going to struggle and it's yeah. not a fun feeling, but you can remove the pressure on yourself. You can mm. still be like, oh, this is hard. I'm nervous, but you don't mm. have to punish yourself for that. You don't have to say I'm stupid. I'm not never going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really good. I know. I feel like it takes a while to feel comfortable speaking a language that isn't your own. Oh, and definitely. I, I take feel like, yeah. And I feel like there's no way to get around it, but yeah. like struggling through it, you know, just For practicing, sure. even though it's awkward, even though it's uncomfortable, even though you're yeah. afraid, mm -hmm. you know, just stepping out and doing it. Yeah, the uncomfort is real. And I think there are some days where I feel like just mentally tired speaking a language. Yeah. And I kind of feel a bit weird thinking back about this. But when I was in Japan, there would be days where when I was really beginner in Japanese, there would be mm -hmm. days where I um, went out for the whole day, I was, you know, exploring, going to museums, whatever, hanging out with friends. And I would be speaking Japanese for like nine hours you know stumbling through it and I got home and I'm like my brain hurts I can't function anymore yeah. and then for example I'll stop at the convenience store on the way home and I would very easily be able to say like um how much is this or I'm paying by cash or whatever else I mm -hmm. needed to to mm -hmm. say but I would speak English then because I, my brain couldn't take it anymore yeah. I was like yeah. I, I I can't be producing this language yeah. as a beginner at this rate yeah uh, I need some some rest yeah 
Totally. Yeah. I can relate to that. So Spanish was the first foreign language that I learned. And in Mexico, we were just thrown into classes every day. And then yeah. we lived with a Mexican family that didn't speak English. Wow, that's so good practice. It was crazy. Me and Calvin would come home from class and we would have to take a nap because we were oh. so tired. Yeah. You know, it was just exhausting. So yeah. I think rest is important in the language oh, learning yeah. process as well. Like getting, sure. getting rest, letting your brain rest. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm a bit worried about a lot of language challenges that have been coming up online these days um, because I've been seeing they crop up on Twitter and Instagram a lot. And I okay. think they're built with good intentions. Like, let's mm -hmm. see how much we can get done. We're working as a group together. Uh, let's stay productive, encourage each other. But I've actually been seeing more and more and more comments from people saying, I'm quitting this challenge. My mental health is at stake. I can't do this. Wow. I'm not getting in the hours that I needed to or the hours that this challenge requires. And I'm yeah. like, this is harmful. It's mm. It started off really good. People are, yeah. have good intentions with working together on a fun mm -hmm. challenge. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with the challenge itself, but it puts so much pressure and people aren't getting rest. Mm. They, I, I read tweets like I stayed up until 4 a.m. just so that I, I could clock my number of hours for today's wow. challenge. Wow. I haven't seen many of these things going around. So yeah. this is like news to me, but that does yeah. sound like maybe not the best idea. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So most of them were just short term, like two weeks or a month. Okay. But I think, I, well, there's not enough data yet to say if they do more more good than more harm. They yeah. seem really fun, like maybe like a summer side project, but yeah. not if you have to um, yeah. miss your sleep or or mm -hmm. um, put mm -hmm. the challenge halfway and put yeah. on social media that you can't get through it anymore. Yeah. yeah. I think the question that I always get, and you probably do as well, is how fast can I learn? Well, English, <laughs> because I teach English online. <laughs> People just want to learn like yeah. today, you know, and it's frustrating. I get it as a language learner. I want to learn fast too, yeah. but it's a process and it takes a lot of time and a lot of investment in the language. And so I always say, yes, if you invest more, you're going to get more out of it. But mm. it is important to set limits as well and rest and take care of yourself too and enjoy the process. Like yeah. we have to find joy in the process. If we don't, yeah. we're going to probably quit. For sure. Yeah. And I think we're so impatient now because everything is so instantly available to us. Mm -hmm. uh, many years ago, we had to go to the library and hope there was a library book there in yeah. the language. If you were lucky yeah. or find a secondhand yeah. store. Now you can just Google translate something and, yeah. and, we're so used to everything being accessible so quickly that we think that applies to everything else in life. Yeah. Growing your finances, even relationships, mm -hmm. uh, languages. Mm -hmm. We think that all of this should be as fast as our information accessibility has yeah. become recently. Mm -hmm. Or even if you think like food delivery, everything else is becoming <laughs> faster, but that's not how it works for languages and, and yeah. relationships. Yeah, totally. Did you say somebody's been asking if you can speak Arabic? So it's totally up to you. I speak no Arabic. <laughs> I don't, did you say you speak Arabic? I cannot remember if it's one I of your languages. I learned it at school, so I can read and write. And But it's been many, many years, so I... Uh... La. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. No. Okay. I don't claim to be able to speak Arabic. It's just a language I learned. If you give me some text, I could read it and write it, okay. but I'm not okay. at a conversational level. Okay. That's good. Yes. Oh, this is a wonderful question that Irina asked. Has speaking different languages influenced the way you see the world? Oh, definitely. I, I'd like to hear your answers too, as well, while okay. I process and think of mine. Yeah. Sure. Are you an are you an um, internal processor? Oh, very much so. It okay. frustrates. I'll get I'll get to your question now, Irina. I just want to say it frustrates my manager at work so much because he yeah. will give me a brief and he'll say, "How does that sound? What do you think? Um, <laughs> can you do this?" And I'm like, "Let me read and process it. Take a walk. Take some yes. notes, and then I can tell you all of the cool plans I have." I can't think like that. I need to internalize things. Um, so even with this question, uh, yeah. beautiful question, I have so many examples. I just need to sift through it in my yeah, mind. Yeah, totally. Words. Well, I can start. Sure. Yeah, I'm an external processor. So oh, usually good. I can just go right off the cuff. <laughs> which, yeah. So how, okay. Has speaking different languages influence the way the, the way you see the world? world? Yes, 100%. I feel like with every new language that I have learned, a new world has opened up to me. 
I'm like, I had no idea people lived their life this way. Because when I learn a language, I meet people. And so then I learn about the culture. And so I learn things that I had no idea about before. And with French, I'm learning, okay, wow, it's not just France that speaks French. So I have mm -hmm. talked to people from Cameroon and yeah. from Belgium and from France and from Canada and just all of these people. And yeah. every place has its culture, has their way of life. And so, of course, when I'm learning a language, I'm asking them how they live, what their life is like, what foods they eat, just so many things about them. So mm -hmm. that has expanded my mindset to be like, my American way of thinking is not the only way That's in so this funny. world, you yeah. know? Like there are so many amazing ways that we can live our life. And so I feel like I learn from people. I'm a learner. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah, similar to you, apart from just learning about new cultures, but I guess similar to your point about um, expanding the way you think, mm -hmm. when you, you can't separate language and culture. And when you learn a language, you are being exposed to a new way of saying things and doing things. Mm -hmm. And some languages have words that we don't have in our native languages. And I remember living in Japan thinking at certain situations like, okay, why do they do it this way? And um, more from the sense of like, let me question why am I used to doing something in one way? Mm -hmm. This could be better or different, or yeah. I could learn something else from this. So learning languages equals learning cultures equals questioning yourself. And, and like you said, your way of thinking is not the only way of thinking. And there's a lot that can be learned not just from being able to speak a language, but from interacting with the people who do speak it. Mm -hmm. If I may, um, Voracious is uh, really seeming like they want to uh, out me here. And I just want to say that, um, what is this? You, you can't speak 12 or 13 languages. Maybe you know a few words. I don't think that's um, really what this live stream is about. I'm not no. here to prove how many languages yeah. I speak. Yeah. I've never claimed to be fluent in any of these. So I, I don't know if you want attention. You're hiding behind a, a profile picture. That's not your face and a name yeah. that's not yours. So please just uh, relax. I don't know why you're here to to prove something. So Yeah, this is a, an interview to get to know Lindy, to hear her wisdom. And she has many videos on her channel in the languages that she does speak. So this isn't an interview to have her speak all of the languages that she is learning or has learned. Yeah, I don't know why people online see language learning as a performative thing. It's a very personal thing. Mm -hmm. It's how we build friendships and relationships with people yeah. and there's no rush. I don't see why this is a race. I'm, yeah. I'm a designer. I should be focusing my time on perfecting my craft and developing the mm -hmm. apps I do. I, I don't have time to do yeah. all the languages in the world and nor do mm -hmm. I claim to and nor do I say that that's my life's mission. It's my hobby. So. Yeah, yeah. It's mine too because I I don't have to learn languages, but exactly. I do it because I love it. It's like yeah. a passion, you know? Yeah, that's the most and important. when it becomes a chore, then maybe you're doing it for the wrong reason, mm. you know? Or when you're doing it to impress people or get yeah. views on YouTube. Yeah. I don't see that as a hobby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody did ask you a question at the top of the chat, but I don't understand it because it's in Tagalog or something. Uh, let so, me see if I can find the question. There are quite a lot of comments. So I do I, hope let me it see. I can actually show it for you. There you go. Oh, do you see that? Thank you, Rohan. <laughs> <laughs> salamat, maraming salamat. So they just uh, encouraged me, told me I could do it, asked how I am, and okay. hope everything is okay with me. So maraming Aww. salamat, and I hope you're doing fine too. <laughs> <laughs> That's so nice. I do find, though, that most of the people that I have met in the language learning community are just supportive of one another and encouraging of one yeah. another. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And that's what I was saying right at the beginning. Like, what's really rewarding about this is that we're all here sharing a mutual hobby. Yeah. And it's also really exciting to be surrounded by so many different people because everybody does something differently. 
Yeah. And that can go both ways. It can be a beautiful thing where you learn from someone. You might not agree. You might say, okay, why do they learn it this way when I think this way works better? But it's yeah. it's healthy to, to explore different viewpoints. But mm-hmm. it can be negative or toxic where people are expecting you to uh, behave a certain way or even learn a certain way. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's debates about flashcards. I'm like, yeah. if it works for you, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah. That's that's such a personal yeah. thing. So yeah, it totally. can go both ways. Totally. Yeah. Everyone learns differently. And so my learning style might be different than yours, but it doesn't mean that one is right or one is wrong. Because, Absolutely. Yeah. There's different ways, just like I there's wonder, different ways to live life. I wonder if I can find it. I was reading such a cool thing in a book today about uh, doing things differently. Uh, mm. If you'll just give me one minute, I wonder if I could find it. But it was, um, you know, if we never do something differently, we're never going to make new discoveries. It was about the painter Cezanne. Okay. I don't know if I can find it, but if, you know, he, he set out to start painting in a way that was um, popular at that time mm-hmm. within a very realistic way. And then he um, changed it completely. And he's almost like the father of modern art now because his um, paintings are so so different and people even his close friends were saying why are you doing it this way um you have no sensitivity uh for your subjects that you paint and he stopped being friends with them and he said i'm just going to continue doing what i like and um you know how influential he is in the art world now wow that's yeah i can't find it now but that was that was really inspirational to me this morning that is amazing yeah i had written down okay maybe changing the topic a little bit, but a lot of people like motivation. So we talked a bit about mindset and then I think motivation is a big thing as well. Mm. If you're not motivated to do something in life, well, unless you absolutely have to do it, you probably won't do it. Yeah. How do you stay motivated personally with the languages you're learning? Oh, very good question because it's not consistent. It's not like you are always going to be motivated in all the languages at the same time. So I almost see it as like um, different phases where I'm really, really interested in one or two languages and then the others take a little bit of a break and then I um, focus on the others. So I, I started learning Hungarian two years, two or three years ago, and I only spent two months on it. And then I stopped. I didn't touch it. I didn't speak it. I didn't read it. So I forgot all of my Hungarian. Right. Um, And I started uh, focusing a lot more on Chinese because I moved to Singapore. Mm-hmm. And then in October, which is about eight or nine months ago, I started restarting Hungarian pretty much from scratch. Uh, so I do kind of regret it. I feel like if I had put in more effort, I would have been able to, you know, consistently learn it for three years. Like, where would I be now? Yes. But I didn't want to force myself to do something that wasn't maybe important at that time. So yeah. you could almost say I didn't have motivation for Hungarian because um, Chinese and Korean were way more important at that mm-hmm. time mm-hmm. until now where I feel like, okay, I'm comfortable with where I am at with the others. Yeah. Let me do it. So to kind of in a roundabout way answer your question is I let it be really natural and mm-hmm. that's touching on what I said earlier about being very emotional. I'm kind of driven just by how I feel. Yeah. And the good thing is that this is my hobby. So I don't need to um, have results or metrics to to yeah. keep my motive. You know, where motivation fails, you need discipline. I think that mm-hmm. works for your career, but not for a hobby. Mm. That is so good. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Hi, you guys coming in. Oh, my good friend, Marika. I met her when I was learning Italian on a language app, and she's oh, from so Italy. Cool. She's one of my best friends now, which is like just shows the beauty that comes out of language learning. Oh, and how lovely. Yeah, I didn't even have a reason for learning Italian. I just chose it because in a, in a Finnish girl, one of my friends said, Camille, why do you only speak Spanish and English? And I was like, I'm doing good as an American to speak another <laughs> language. But it spurred something in me, you know? Yeah, that's so, so cool. Yeah, it's amazing. What do you like about your life in Singapore? How long have you been there? I don't know much about the culture at all. I would love to learn a little bit from you and hear your thoughts. Yeah, I just want to say hello to Katerina and Elena. Thank you guys so much for the comments. And it's lovely to see you here. Thank you. you, Uh, I've been in Singapore since February 2019. So I had about a solid year. Um, I'm just laughing at some of these comments. (laughs) 
<laughs> I had about a solid year before lockdown, so I'm really grateful for that. And Singapore is incredibly multicultural. So wow. there are four four um, official languages. The national language is Malay, and then okay. there's English, Tamil, and Mandarin Chinese, and multiple wow. um, Chinese languages or Chinese dialects like Hokkien, Hakka, Teochew. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's beautiful. The architecture is stunning. I love the the history. Yeah. I'm very interested in World War II history, and and we learn about um, you know the the main players in in history at school, but nobody really talks about or learns about what went on in Singapore or the Straits during mm. World War II. So there's a very rich and very interesting history. Wow. Um, so I enjoy um, learning about Singapore. It's such a small country. It's mm -hmm. about the size of. Um, I just I just heard a comparison today. Um, a, a German city. It's not Berlin. Uh, Hamburg. Could it be Hamburg? It's about the same size as one of one of those cities, but it's triple the population. So the landmass is Whoa. quite small, but it's very densely populated. Um, wow. And the food is great. Singapore is like a food hotspot. People take cooking very seriously. That oh, people joke yeah. here that um, eating is a national pastime, and that is really oh. true. There's a huge food culture here. Wow. Do you have a favorite food? Um, it's gonna sound really basic by the name. It's called chicken rice, but uh -huh. it's delicious. The the way they flavor the rice, the mm. softness of the chicken. There's little slices of cucumber on the side and some black sauce on top. I love chicken rice. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and do you feel like it's easy to make friends? Well, obviously right now, maybe it's a little different with Corona and everything, yeah. but do you feel like it's a pretty easy place just to meet people, to build friendships, to connect, or do people kind of stick to, I don't know, their families or their own just mm -hmm. circles, circles of people? I would say that depends on your hobbies, the things you'll do outside of work, okay. as well as maybe the place you're working at. Okay. So I'm really grateful that, you know, the type of company I work in, our colleagues, we really like to hang out together. We have a lot in common. So it was easy to make friends with my colleagues mm -hmm. outside of work. There are a lot of meetup groups, but what I mean is it depends on your hobbies is most of the groups I'm in are language exchange groups. So I, yeah. before lockdown, I went to a Spanish exchange group. And last year I went to Mundo Lingo, which is where we get all these flags of oh, languages cool. you want to practice. So there's lots of like yeah. fun groups you can join in. Um, apart from like the language and the tech space, I have no idea because those are the only spaces I really move in. Yeah. 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 And do you plan on staying in Singapore like it's home for you? Do you do you plan on just living your life there for a while? Or I'm not sure thoughts? yet. It's okay. a very small country landmass physically, so it does mm -hmm. get a bit cabin fevery. Um, it's a bit intimidating to think I could be here for the rest of my life. So I yeah. don't plan ahead that much. If it happens, it happens. It was meant to happen, but that's uh, in God's hands and not in mine. So I'll see. Yeah. I'll see what happens. But mm -hmm. I know a lot of people do come to Singapore planning to stay for one or two years and they end up staying for eight to 10 because it's wow. very livable. It's very okay. easy to live here. The government is is very organized. It's very easy to get um, things done. Things work really well. Um, so it's it's very livable. Yeah. But I'm not sure if this is where I want to be long term. Also, because I'm too excited to try different <laughs> countries and experience different cultures. Yeah, totally. Yeah. What would be one or two countries that you're like, if I could live there, I would go. I would love to live in Hungary, but I'm extremely afraid of the cold. Oof, yeah. So um, I, even in South Africa, where we don't get a lot of snow during winter, barely any, I mm -hmm. had seasonal affected disorder in oh, winter. No. Like I was legit depressed in winter. Wow. And that's one of the reasons I moved to a tropical country so that yeah. it's permanently summer. Yeah. So as much as I would want to live, experience living in Europe, I've never lived in Europe, um, mm -hmm. it would it would uh, be too difficult for me in the winter. Yeah, I grew yeah. up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, which is basically bordering Canada. Oh my goodness. Freezing. <gasps> and one of the biggest reasons I moved away is because of the cold. I was so tired of being cold yeah. and having winter for six months out of the year. Yeah. So I feel wow. you on that one. I love, yeah. I love it here in South Carolina where it's sunny and warm and even Barcelona where we lived a couple of years in oh, Mexico. So nice. I'm realizing maybe we have a thing with the warm. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> totally. 
Totally. I loved this. There was a, okay, a good, another good one. I'll just pop it up there. So do you feel that depending on the area of your life or the activity you carry out, do you express or feel more connected to one language or another, or does it not make a difference? Depending on the area of your life do you or the activity, that? do you feel, okay, I think I understand. Yeah. Um, maybe if I take um, my faith as an example, I learned yeah. to pray in Afrikaans. So it's very, um, it's like a natural muscle memory for me when I start praying. I might start off in Afrikaans because that's how I learned, but I could finish up in English or Korean or Japanese, mm -hmm. you know, whatever mm -hmm. pops into my head. Yeah. Um, for math, I'm terrible at numbers. And uh, of course, I went to English schools, so I can only do math in English, uh, but barely even do math in English. <laughs> yes. um, and uh, for design, like when I'm researching new trends in design, uh, I'm always excited to explore different languages. So I read up and I listen to a lot of podcasts in um, Hungarian, Korean and Japanese and Spanish and French. Mm -hmm. Those are my okay. main ones for finding good UX resources. There's a yeah. lot of amazing podcasts for design. Mm -hmm. And I like to see what other um, cultures or languages value about design. The French podcast I listen to focus very specifically, like there will be an entire podcast about designing a search bar, which wow. is one small UI element. And then um, the Mexican podcasts I listen to about design are more about like culture and mm -hmm. how can your design um, improve society, stuff like that. So it's really interesting for me to see how uh, one topic like design is approached differently depending on the language or the culture. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. really good. I like that. Um, there was another question. I thought this was interesting too. Timothy had. So out of interest in Dutch, there are many idiomatic sayings connected with water, the sea, and cheese <laughs> due to the culture and geography. Is this also true in Afrikaans? Very interesting question. Yeah. Uh, well, South Africa doesn't have those many, like, I guess canals or, or islands or we're not such a water-based culture as as the Netherlands might be but mm -hmm. a lot of our place names um, or, or words in our language obviously come very close from Dutch. Um, interestingly enough the word for kitchen in Afrikaans is kombuis and kombuis only means a ship's kitchen in Dutch oh, and that's because Dutch sailors were spending time on ships for so long that when they settled in South Africa, the word for kitchen was only a ship's kitchen. So Dutch people really laugh at that. They're like, that's really archaic or that's really weird. Yeah. Uh, but we, Afrikaans also has a lot of um, other native South African languages, words that are mixed into it. And as well as like, we have Malay roots. So it's quite a um, mixed language, mm -hmm. uh, not just a hundred percent coming mm -hmm. from Dutch. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Wow. Yeah. If you guys have any more questions here for Lindy, feel free to write it in the question box. Oh my goodness, it's actually been almost an hour on live stream. So maybe we would just answer or she would just answer one or two more questions because yeah, I try not to keep my guests for more than an hour. I have my list of questions. Oh, okay. This would be good. Do you have any just personal dreams or goals that you're thinking about for the future? And do you want to share anything right now with us, like anything that you're working on yeah. with, with your channel or anything at all? I would love to hear. Yeah, so I'm really looking to move more into the space, the intersection of languages and design. Mm -hmm. So I'm just too passionate about design to to leave that and go into languages full time. Yeah. So at the moment, I'm working um, on some side projects with friends on, on language apps. And that's really what I want to um, talk about more once the time is ready, like once those apps are released or improved. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's that. And then I guess most of my languages, I just want to get up to good advanced levels. I'm not going to be adding any new <laughs> languages now, even though people love asking and I would I love know. to learn them all. Um, <laughs> and I hope to keep um, updating videos at least once a week. It's, it's hard work. It takes a lot of time to edit everything and film. And uh, I, I hope to 
continue with my YouTube channel, but no big plans like opening an academy or um, yeah. tutoring any languages. Not not for now. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. You guys have a few questions. What What's your favorite word to say? Do you have a favorite word in any language or oh. any expression? Or, this is actually my husband asking. He's watching our live. Oh, how interesting. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So many. So many. Yeah. I'd probably have to open my Hungarian book next to me because yeah, I have. I just love up. the way. But I like all the words. Um, <laughs> actually, somebody asked me that question recently, so I can actually look at it. I think they asked me what my favorite word was or my favorite sound. Let me see if I can find it. Maybe you can answer this question first. Oh, my goodness. I'm trying word. to think as well. I'm oh, trying. Oh, okay, good. It's a gümürç, which means fruits in Hungarian. I just think it sounds really cute. Okay, okay. Yeah. You know what words make me laugh in French as an American speaker? What? Donk. It just sounds like there's just this oh. beautiful French language, and then it's just like donk. Donk. <laughs> yes. I never thought of that. Yeah, like you're just hearing the flow, and then donk. It's just <laughs> funny to me. I don't know why. Never thought of that. And then me. the word for garbage can, which is poobel. Okay, I must say that as kids, we laughed about that a lot. Yes. And what makes it even worse is that in Paris, there is, I don't know if it happens anymore, we were there during the 90s, there's a guy on a motorbike who yeah. cleans dog poo on the street. Oh. Every morning, we called him like the pooper scooper or the poop motorbike guy and that was just the funniest thing for us as immature children. Oh my goodness, I'm sure, I'm sure. Yeah. I couldn't believe it the first time I heard it. I was like, that is not really the word. It can't be. <laughs> it does sound funny to English ears for sure. Yes. Okay. Oh, this is also good. I'll put this I'll put this question up there. Actually, yeah. it was this one. I did the wrong one. What do you do when you get tired of learning languages? Or do you get tired? Oh, of course. Um, yeah. Somebody sent a tweet recently uh, saying, at Lindy Buddhist, can you please make, or why hasn't Lindy made a video about how she's able to study languages after a long work day? And I said, well, I haven't made a video about that. Or well, the question was like, why hasn't she made a video about how she's able to learn languages after a long work day when she might just feel like wanting to go to bed? And I said, I didn't make that video because I go to bed. <laughs> if that's I am good. tired, I sleep. Yeah, that's <laughs> And that's good. not to say that it's like um, super easy to learn languages that you can just sleep. Of course, you have to put hard work in. But yeah. when I get tired, I have to rest. My brain is literally not going to function. Yeah. I would rather sleep. Yeah. Unless this person meant get tired of like maybe get bored of the language, mm. uh, then I do take a break. And it's mm. not like I got bored with Hungarian after learning it for three months. There were other situations or circumstances that I had to leave it for two or three years. Yeah. Um, so you could you could if you get bored of a language, you could leave it and see if you feel motivated or excited to learn it again after mm -hmm. a long time, then mm -hmm. it'll come back to you. If you were meant to yeah. learn the language, it'll come back to you. That's good. That's yeah. good. We did touch on this. I don't want you to think we're ignoring, like we both said we get anxious sometimes speaking oh, sure. new languages. It's scary still for me with French. I'm like, no, don't make me do it. But I want to do it at the same time because yeah. I know that if I can just keep walking in the struggle, I'll get better, I'll get stronger. Yeah, so. yeah. This is kind of along the same lines. Lola, do you have any tips for anyone who wants to continue learning a language but sometimes wants to give up because I struggle with this more often? I think it's real, that's like real. That's a real struggle with language yeah. learners. Yeah, I've definitely felt like giving up um, when it's hard, you you have to question why you started. Is this something you want to put in more effort yes. in? Of course, if it's really tough on you, you should take a break. You should rest. You should not compare yourself to others. Yeah. You should take it easy. Yeah. But if you feel like this is something I really, really want in my life, you should make a plan that works with your schedule, mm -hmm. the levels of motivation, the levels of time you have. Yeah. Um, but I'd say go easy. Take a break. If you feel like you don't want to learn it now, if it's not your job to learn this language, if you're not getting paid to learn the language, take a break. It's completely fine. Yeah. I don't know if you have any different views or advice. Yeah. On that. No, I think that's good. So I actually went through this recently with French 
around the four Mm -hmm. to six month mark, I was just struggling so much. And even though I speak the other romance languages, French felt so different for me because like Spanish, all the letters sound the same. It's phonetic. Portuguese felt pretty easy because it was so connected to Spanish. So even though I spent a year studying it, it didn't feel like French. Same with Italian. It's a phonetic language. So with French, I was so frustrated and Mm. I did want to give up. But I just, I remembered like my why. I'm like, remember Camille, why are you learning French? So I think taking it back to your why is super important. And just Mm -hmm. remembering like, why am I wanting to learn this language? And if your why is strong enough and if it's still the same reason and it's still there, I would say that you do have to continue to push through. And so I did, I was like, okay, every day, day after day, a little bit of French, a little bit of Mm. French. And for some reason, someday, like around the seven month mark, I started to feel like motivated to learn French and it changed everything. Everything for me changed. And now I actually want to learn it. I feel super motivated. I'm liking it, which before I was always like, yeah, oh, she did this, the concept. <laughs> I was like so struggling. The struggle was so strong. Yeah. So I don't know. Like I can't say that same thing's gonna happen for you because everyone's language learning journey is unique. But I say if your why is strong, keep pressing through. If you need to take a day, a week of rest and then come back to it. Or I also say changing it up to do Mm. something completely different. Try to meet something new, somebody new, or watch a new movie, or read a new book, or if you can, plan a trip to the place that speaks the language. Just things to try to find your motivation again, I Mm. think, could Mm. help. Yeah. Good, yeah. (laughs) I get super passionate, too, talking about languages. Yeah. That's why we're here. I love it, yes. Okay, so, oh, this is actually good because I could learn from you in this as well, Lindy. How do I study different family languages, Japanese and Chinese? Does this mean... So he is like, I think maybe he's a Spanish speaker, like he knows like the romance languages, but how can you shift and study something that's not a romance language? Oh, I thought he meant Japanese and Chinese are from different families. How, how would you learn those two? But they kind of I, have a little bit of similarities. Okay. Oh, my goodness. I am not sure how to answer this. Um, okay. That's okay. You don't have to. That's, that's a hard question. I'd yeah. have to think about this. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's necessarily like a different approach you have to take just because it's from a different language family. You take the same route from starting from zero building up some basic vocabulary, understanding the grammar and building up from there. Um, The only thing that might be difficult for most people is uh, sentence uh, word order. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it was easier for me to learn Japanese because um, Korean and Japanese have exactly the same sentence order, which is um, subject, object, verb. Um, so while I struggled my way through Korean as a beginner, I didn't have that struggle with Japanese because I could immediately relate it to a Korean example. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and with French, I guess I had a whole school background learning it and struggling through it for 12 years that I was at a okay enough level in French to be able to move on to something new and just really struggle through Korean for the first two or three years. Yeah. Yeah. In your opinion, I have heard this comment. Somebody said Korean is the easiest out of Japanese, Korean, and Chinese or Mandarin to learn. Would you say that's true? I don't think any language is easier or yeah. harder. It's it's yeah. it depends on your background, your mm-hmm. language background, the amount of resources you have. If I, you know, in high school, I had so many Korean friends around me. Of course, yeah. it was easy for me because I was hearing it the whole time. Yeah. Mandarin Chinese was difficult because I maybe didn't have friends around me who speak it. If you mm-hmm. live in China, of course, Chinese is going to seem a lot easier than Korean. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. I mean, you, you can go into a lot of um, linguistic analysis and say, okay, well, Chinese has simpler grammar, uh, but mm-hmm. it has complex characters. Korean has really, yeah. really, really simple characters, but complex grammar and mm-hmm. uh, levels of formality. Mm-hmm. 
So it's difficult in different ways. I, yeah. I It's like comparing apples to oranges. Mm, that's yeah. good. That's good. I like that. Yeah. I like this question. I can personally say yes. On the topic of difficulties in learning language, have you underestimated or overestimated the difficulty of learning a language? Yeah. So I really kind of went into French thinking because it's in the romance family, it's going to be easy. And That's what happened to my Spanish? Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't and it's not. Yeah. It's hard. So yeah. I underestimated it. And now I'm completely but it helps me. It helped me because now I feel like I've grown from this. Now I'm going to take a more neutral approach it's to the next thing. language. For sure. <laughs> yes. And yeah. I agree. Every language is difficult to learn. Every language is a lifetime of learning. We never mm -hmm. arrive to a point where we're like, I've mastered completely 100% this language. Yeah. It's a journey. And the languages that we give more time to, we're obviously going to speak better than the languages that we give less time to. Yeah. I don't know. Have you underestimated or overestimated any difficulty of learning a language? Um, I guess the only thing I can think of similar to you, just the other way around with, with Spanish, um, it, it was super easy to get started, to get from zero to be, being able to have a conversation. Very yeah. simple because I could always guess the meaning with my knowledge of French. Yeah. Um, but now when I'm moving into more complex grammar, I'm like, oh, it's kind of tricky. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. not like just because you speak one Roman's language, you're able to speak another one. You might be able to understand it, but not really produce it unless yeah. you put in the hard work. Yes, that is really good. Wow, this has been really good. You've given so many just amazing insights to language learning. I've learned a bit about just you as a person, about Singapore, and I really appreciate you being here and giving me your time. Thank you so much for having me. It was really, really fun to talk to you and also learn from you and the ways you think about language learning. So it was awesome. Yeah, Thank you. This was amazing. Thank you, everyone, as well, who was a part yeah. of this live stream. Be sure to check out Lindy's channel, which we will link below. Follow her channel, subscribe to her channel and to her Instagram as well. And if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, I would love to have you. And yeah, we just thank you guys. We wish you a great day or evening wherever you are. And never give up with language learning. You can do it. Yeah, it takes a long time. I feel like wanting to give up all the time, but baby steps keep going. Yes. Thanks for having me. Yes, thank you. Bye, you guys. Bye.